Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we get an inside take on Zero's journey as a publicly listed tech startup from its former country manager, Wayne Schmidt. In this episode, we examine the listing process and how an IPO strategy worked for Zero, which, if you haven't heard of it, is now a very widely used accounting software. After we examine the listing process, we also look closely at the background of the two founders, Rod Drury and Hamish Edwards. So if you're a tech startup interested in listing or an advisor to tech startups who want to IPO, keep listening and we'll get started. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area. And hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Wayne, can I just say, firstly, a massive thank you for coming in today onto our show. I know this is going to be a big blast. Let's just kick it off. You are talking to us from Koh Samui, right? Yes, and I've put a nice shirt on just for you. I'm currently travelling on a one-way ticket around the world, and and I only have one shirt. I am actually in short, to be honest. Now, for you listeners, many of our listeners will just be getting the audio of this. Well, I'll tell you what, we might even release some of the uh, video of this because that was quite funny, Wayne. That was hilarious. <laughs> so you're sitting there in Koh Samui because you're living the dream. You're on a one-way ticket and seeing the world. Is that right? Yes, one-way ticket. But I'm calling myself a digital nomad now. Digital so. nomad. Okay. I like it. I like the term. What the hell does that even mean? We've set up our business so that we can work anywhere. So we can work remotely and still travel. Fundamentally, after we launched Zero, we were sitting down figuring out what we wanted to do in our life. And we wrote down all our passions and travel was one of them. Philanthropy is a huge one for us. And still wanting to work and give back, but in our own time. So we wanted to control our own destiny. And controlling our destiny meant, well, we had to really restructure our lives. We sold up everything in Australia and then just did a, the leap of faith. And Australians are pretty good at saying, gonna, gonna do this, gonna do that. They are, 100%. <laughs> so you put action behind it, Wayne, you put action behind it. Yeah, I'm very much an executional type guy. I like to, I'm best at a startup in the first two years. After that, I tend to spend most of my time in the HR department. Let's not drill there further. (laughs) So let's go back then a few years. I guess the story that we want to talk about today is Zero as a whole, how the business grew to a successful exit, how that exit felt and how it worked. But let's just go all the way back because I think in some of our discussions in the past, you said that the plan for, and I guess it's not IPO, it's not an exit, but but the plan for the outcome of Zero was formed right at the beginning. So Zero was formed on the basis of how the business saw itself at the end. It had a very clear strategy. Like uh, So Zero is it's a New Zealand company. It was formed in 2006 by Rod Jury and Hamish Edwards, so two co-founders, um, an entrepreneur, which is Rod Jury, and an accountant, Hamish Edwards. And they formed Zero with a strategy that they were always going to list because they realised that you're going to need capital to, to get a software development as big as this. Writing an accounting product isn't cheap. Uh, they wanted to go wide, so they wanted to go you know, multinational from day one. So they ha- they went straight with a, you know an IPO listing very early on, like within the first year they'd IPO'd. Wow! Uh, on the New Zealand Stock Exchange within a year, and 
get that funding. And they did the bare minimum, like it was a what we call a minimal viable product MVP achievement. It basically means it doesn't work. <laughs> but and, and what year was this, Wayne? 2006 is when it formed, got listed 2007 on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. And I was working for the, the direct competitor. I was working for MYB. So I, at that stage, I was the country manager for MYB over in, in the UK. And I'd been watching... MYB, we were, you know, we had a quarterly or we meetings where all the country manager or GMs or managing directors would come together from each region and we'd look at zero and go, oh, we've got a thousand customers, it's from New Zealand, it's cloud, the cloud's never going to take off. You know, no, 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 it's nothing. It's just, Wayne, would you just shut up? And I got the, Wayne, will you just shut up often? And I was sitting there going, I really think this product can go places. And you've got to remember in those days, especially in Australia, NYB is the market leader. It's just huge, you know. And I can remember it was a Friday afternoon. I still remember it quite vividly. Zero wasn't in Australia. They're in New Zealand. Their share price had been a dollar for a couple of years. This is, in, you know, it's in those early years, those real struggle years. It was gradually, slowly getting clients in New Zealand. And Friday afternoon, I sent an email to their CEO, Rod Dury, saying, hey, we should catch up and have coffee. Now, um, big alert for all the people here. If you have your staff saying they're going down to have coffee, they're going to look for a job, okay? Okay, I'm writing this down. This is actually good intel. Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Here's your staff saying, I'm out to have coffee today. Right, they're looking for a job. And that's what happened. And I can still remember I sent an email to Rod because um, I'd found, you know, I'd met Rod on LinkedIn and, you know, and that's how I was introduced through the technology. And over the process of about three or four months, um, a very, very long interview process and selection process to get through. I was interviewed by everybody, including the janitor, by, I think, by the end of it. And one thing led to another and I ended up getting the job, so being the country manager. So we launched Zero in Australia on the 1st of October 2009. And we're a startup. Like, we launched it on our kitchen table. Wow, that is incredible. And I tell you what, I remember, you know, I was starting my practice at around about, my legal practice at around about that time. And I'd always come from use of my op in the, in, you know, the background. But I, I wanted to, you know, start this legal practice a little bit more innovative than practices that I'd been in in the past. And so I was on to zero at the end of 2009. So I must have been some of your first starters here in Australia. But I just remember at the time just thinking, you know, this is awesome from a business perspective, how much easier it is from the user experience as a business, as a business owner to integrate with the software without, you know, I started the business as a a really small entity. So I didn't have a lot in terms of staffing. So I wanted stuff that was practical. And and I guess Zero is just that perfect example, right, of of that type of, I I guess, disruptor, you you know, whilst it's not disruptor in the Uber sense. (laughs) Certainly it was a different way of doing accounting, bookkeeping software, right? Um, I actually, I would actually say we were disruptive, and I'll challenge you on that one, Joanna. You know, you're launching a software company against the entrenched player, like entrenched. MIB is a household brand name. You know, it was, and I worked there. You know, I headed up marketing at one stage. You know, I had a marketing budget where I could just go and stick the brand on the back of a bus, and they think I was good. And so we decided we had a couple of things that we decided we first of all we were always going to lead from the front so we were not going to mention the competitor so we never mentioned our competitor's name and we always lead from the front but we were disrupting and so when we're disrupting you're going to have to educate one of the things we learned i learned very young is to disrupt you have to educate i remember employee number two is my wife in the, the company so what Sally was what i still remember how she got hired rod was um over from new zealand we're at our local Greek restaurant, um, and my wife and I, Sally, and, and Rod Jury, the co-founder and CEO, and uh, Sally went to the bathroom and Rod said, we should hire her. And I went, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> would be good if you gave me the budget. <laughs> so we ended up Sally became, and that was possibly one of the things that made um, Zero what it was in those early days because she's a sales operational person. So having a sales ops person and a sales marketing person, such a blend, 
she just got me in a car and I did um, a massive road trip around the um, you know, eastern seaboard of Australia. I would be visiting two cities a day, doing events like this you know, in front of maybe six people. I'd dance if I ever got to ten. It was hard. Like it was a lot. People think, oh, well, you just do some online advertising. Well, that's not going to work because I had a marketing budget of nothing. So um, we had to figure out what we could do, which was events. And the other thing was social media. You know, I learned everything I know about social media through zero and specifically um, Catherine Walker, big shout out to Orange Girl. She taught me everything. Orange Girl's her tag and uh, anybody from zero would know. She manages their social media and, and they led with social media because you, we could we realised the leverage effect that you could, it was a one to many. I only got onto Twitter, you know, like a month before I went to start working at zero and now I, I talk about social media all the time around the world and how you can leverage it for any business. What, what was the background of the two founders before they started Zero in New Zealand? Do you know? Oh, yes. Oh, well, Rod Jury was um, a very successful entrepreneur. He'd set up a, a company called Aftermail prior to Zero, uh, which was um, some type of backup facility for mail and something like that really don't know, to be honest, but he'd um, made some, and I'll look, you know. <laughs> Whatever, something in the text. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, Got it. Story. But it, it gave him some funding. So that one of the things is it gave him some funding and gave him some skill sets of setting up a company, selling a company. You know, your company is only worth what somebody's prepared to pay for it. So get over it. Exactly. Here's a classic example. Wayne got greedy once, had an offer to sell one of my previous companies. I said, no, it's worth more than that, and ended up, got nothing, like absolutely nothing. And that was silly. So, you know, your company's only worth what somebody's prepared to pay for it right now when they're going to give you a check. But he'd, he'd sold the company, so he'd learnt, he'd really learnt setting it up, selling it, uh, get, having an exit strategy. And Hamish as an accountant was uh, was sick of what I call dirty data files. So you've got to go back. So take the way back machine, go back into the 2000s. Imagine you're an accountant in 2005. And the way your client sent their data to you was on a you know, CD-ROM or well, normally a CD-ROM or they might email you their data. Here's my data for the year. But the problem is it might be on an old version and you're on the latest version. If you upgrade it, you can't send it back to them. And then the client might send, you might start working on it and then the client says, oh, sorry, that was the wrong year or that was the wrong data. Or the client goes and works on it while you're still working on it. So you could see the massive inefficiency, and I call them dirty data files. The inefficiency, it was a really good study. I think it was done by, I might not be quoting this correctly, so I think it was done by Deloitte that 25% of an accounting firm's billable time now that'll get everybody interested, was lost trying to get the data from the client into the accounting practice. So 25% of your billable time. So this was really about identifying, you know, a real issue and then going out and um, saying, well, there's nothing out there, like let's just design it ourselves. That That's amazing. That was one of the big things. Like if you think... So it wasn't a here's a big trap. People think, oh, well, that, what they did was they got desktop, a desktop product and moved it to the cloud. Well, that's not disrupting. Yeah. What you did was get something that used to work really, really quickly and put it onto a cloud platform that in, potentially would run slower. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was disruptive was saying, okay, what was the problem? The problem was an accounting firm. having, And you've got to think about the numbers, the average accounting firm her partner has, say, 200 clients. Um, they might have a three-partner firm. That would be 600 um, data files. They might have multiple entries. So they're probably dealing with a 1,000 data files per practice, 1,000 different versions. Wow. Data. You imagine the pain, the absolute pain that they're in. So you'll hear this term called the single ledger, e.g. I just want one version of the data. I don't want to have to I just want to be able to log in and look at your data. I don't want you to have to send it to me. I don't want to have to send it back to you. So that was the problem that Hamish came up with. So Hamish was the accountant saying, I don't want to deal with a 1,000 data files. And Rod was the technology person saying, well, why don't we do 
accounting in the cloud. But he was getting the accounting in the cloud. But when you get those two, the technology person and the uh, the practical accountant, and you put fuse them together, you get something quite beautiful. Yeah, that's amazing. And and um, I, I thought, you know, in, in your relaying that story, there's a couple of things that really jumped out at me. And one was, you know, you talking about Rod's experience in his previous business setting him up for this. And um, I had this interesting discussion in, in a previous podcast on The Deal Room, um, which we'll link through to in, in these notes, where we were talking about the importance of exits to innovation in businesses as a whole, because the whole process of businesses, you know, entrepreneurs starting up their first business or their second business and then exiting it in some form, whether it's successful or not successful, but the things they learn from that, taking that into the next business. And then if they exit that, the next again, and building and building and building until they get really good at really identifying what's truly innovative and what will really take off. And so, it, it, you know, I'm thinking of, of that discussion when I'm hearing you talk about, Rod, here. And, and even your own experience here when you said your involvement in previous in a previous company where you'd left it too long before you sold your shares, you know, obviously that really helped drive your behaviour with your zero shares where you were, where, where you had your, you know, your stop loss as it was, where, where you took your shares off the table but watched others around you who obviously didn't have that experience. So I, I guess it just goes to show that there's a really big importance of, we've talked about you individually, the importance of being able to change positions over time, but also from an entrepreneurial perspective really maybe there's a lot to be said for doing this process really re reworking out where is the right place for you and not holding on to things for too long you know what a good it, there's a classic here because you know zero is co-founded by two people and if you notice Hamish Edwards you don't care about Hamish exited the company very early on so probably two years after I'd started maybe maybe a year I'd been there for the first four years. Um, He's now, I love his LinkedIn title. I think it says gentleman. (laughs) And I love that because he is an accountant and he was heading up sales and he's an accountant. It wasn't his position. It wasn't his passion, Um, you know. And it's like Rod. Rod, Rod's now, I think, uh, he's moved on to he's more in not the CEO, so he's not in the strategic view is more in the um, product innovation and looking at the future of the product and still thinking about that. So everybody has a journey. It's, I think it's terrible when you, pe- you see people just clinging onto that role that they've had all the time thinking, well, I'll just grow as the role grows and you've now I've got 2,000 people underneath me and that's what I'm supposed to do. No, you don't. You, you can change and, and it's nothing – Nothing wrong with accepting that things will change. Like you'll do sidesteps like I've done now. Like I'm on a sidestep now. That's so I, what I'm doing now is so different to what, you know, my, my, I've got a degree in applied science mathematics programming. I'm supposed to be a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> I so don't pick that. that that's crazy one. I actually have. I couldn't even add up to save myself. You're like, and, and, you know, I used to cut. The one thing is, and it's some of the things I, I love about my university and my cutting code is I still know when programmers are spinning stuff because I might not cut code these days, but you just know because I can smell it, I can sense it, and they know that I can cut code enough to know when mm, potentially you might be lying to me um, because I'll say some words I'm going, yeah, I think you're lying to me now. Um, and that, having that little bit of skill set, but... And you know, now it's – there's a, a really um, – I, I wrote a chapter in, in, in this book called um, uh, Better Business, Better World, um, which is part of the B1, Green, B1 Business for Good group that I'm part of, and um, which was always fundamentally look at your life at this particular point in time, like – you know, I'm 56 now I'm on a different stage of life. So don't try and, okay, don't compete against, you know, like I have some of my friends you know, that are in their 30s going, oh, I wish I had your life. I'm going, yeah, but you're 30. 
You're not going to have your life. You're 30. Get over it. You know, when I was 30, I was sitting there working my guts out. You know, it's like when I was, even forget like the early days of zero. We didn't have a cleaner. It was Sally and me. We cleaned the toilets in the company. People forget about those early days. We did it every Friday. I got toilet duty. Sally got the vacuum duty. Uh, we did that for the first year because we had no money to afford a cleaner. So we would do the cleaning. Um, and we did it because we didn't want the team to do it. Um, so don't compare yourself to other people, different age brackets, different social economics. All you do is compare yourself about, am I achieving what I should be achieving based on my skill sets and my passions and what I've got and what tools I've got right now? There's a number of things that I'd like to talk about, about where you are right now. But before we do that, I just want to go back and and talk about Zero's um, progress of listing in Australia um, and, uh, you know, maybe you can walk us through what happened and then let, let's investigate each of those areas because I think this will be quite interesting to our listeners who are thinking about uh, listing and and some of the you know some of the process uh, and the realities of what it involves it because and and just to just before we get into that I think I talk to a lot of businesses who um, have this concept of listing at the back of their mind because it's it's this part of gold right it's the business rainbow right? <laughs> but oh. I just I I just think you know it's really interesting to have these discussions when they're really grounded in reality well let's look at you know, how it really happens. So anyway, tell us about that that history. So we we know that it was listed in New Zealand, brought zero to Australia, um, and then w- what happened up to the listing in, in Australia and walk us through it all? Mm. So, so New Zealand, you know, zero is always going to at least do a dual listing. Um, yeah. And so getting it, and, and one of the things is setting up in a, in New Zealand was it, it you know, and that gave them that the uh, initial capital injection they needed to you know, fund the development and fund you know the growth of the company in New Zealand, and you then needed to you know go and expand more. And New Zealand market space is limited for that fund to try fundraising. You know, obviously, coming across to Australia was great. It was an, it was an easy by that stage. There was, you know, starting to you know grow quite well market share wise. We had good numbers. You know, it was it was a good story to tell. You know, then all the growth numbers, everything that we were doing was a good story to tell. Um, both the potential investors, the media. Um, we had our poster child. You know, um, Chris uh, Ridge, who was just you know, he's got a great um, presence, um, media presence, and that's really important too. You know, and this, and this is one of the things I keep talking about skill sets. I don't like that. You could not put me on a TV. There's not enough money in the world. Um, so I don't want to do that. So you've got to have the right front person. And, you know, Chris was the person for that. So he's really good at doing all the media interviews. So the listing went you know, really well. All the, you know, they'd already done the regular groundwork in New Zealand. So this was kind of like a, you know, basically a repeat of the same process. Um, Gained the good press, and, you know, started winning awards, software awards, leadership awards, you know, this is the leadership team, so Chris Reed, you know, um, you know, I think he was CEO of the year and some thing, awards like that. And we were winning software awards. So everything just time. So you've got to – so this is – you're building up. So you're not just saying, oh, we're going to launch on this day. Well, you've got to have to have done a whole range of steps, not just, you know, have got proven market, you've got enough sales, got the team right. Um, getting them branding right. Now, we launched, and here's the classic thing, you know, is knowing when to get out, you know, and especially for employees. Employees can get um, traditionally in software vendors, not speaking out of school, traditionally anybody in the first 100 staff of a software vendor will become quite successful, independently wealthy, and just by working by that software, well, it's normally the first 100 because you end up, the share packages just work that way. If you have a look at Microsoft, you have a look at all the original companies, the first 100 are the ones that normally do it because you're taking the, I always call it the leap of faith. And it's like any kind, I, I want to thank all those accounting firms out there, there's some firms out there, um, you know, Paul Meissner, um, Five Ways, who took 
who came to the first session. I've got a photo of him in a room of 10 people who took what I call the leap of faith. You went there when no one else went there. And so that's the same with employees. They tend to that first 100 who take massive pay cuts. I can remember hiring salespeople and they were on, you know, over $100,000 salaries and I was offering them 40000 Wow. You know, like massive pay cuts and I call it a leap of faith. So they deserve to be um, well remunerated in shares, but that's, that's all you've got. So the, but, however, the catch with shares is knowing when to get out. And, you know, and I watched the zero share price and it's one stage. So we had a, a point that, you know, we said, you know, how much is enough? And write down what is your number. Write it down and go, once it gets to this, yeah, it might go more, but take something off the table. So once we got to $30, we took some money off the table. Uh, and then when it got to 35 we took more. Then it hit 40 we took as much as we could. And then the zero share price tanked and went down to, I think, $18. Wow. That's some really big movements there because you talked about starting at a dollar. So we went from a dollar to 40 and then down to 18 and now I think it's back up around the 40 mark. But when it went down, to, I think it got down to 12 at one stage and it stayed at 12 for a year or so. Like, so my advice for, say, employees, take some money off the table when you can so that at least you go, if something goes wrong, I've, you know, don't be greedy. Yeah. How much is enough? You know, take something back. You don't have to sell all your shares, but take something off the table because – you never know with shares. Shares are so volatile that you wake up one morning, you've got a new president elected, and all of a sudden everything just tanks, and it's beyond your control. And that, and that happens, and, and things happen. We only need. So that, that's why I strongly recommend take something off the table. At least take your original investment off, and then you, no matter what, you can't go backwards. At least you've got your money back. But people get, people get greedy. I noticed that some people, you know, Wanted fifty dollars. They want. They weren't going to sell until they got to fifty. And I went. Went down to twelve. You, you. So yeah, we took out money. Um, that was that. That's my piece of advice. And so, tell me, what else was happening in in the general business? Zero D listed in in New Zealand. Was that right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and and what? Why was that? What led to that? Um, I can't say at this stage because I was. And that was half my time, so I don't know. I assume it was because the, you know, the, it made more sense to be only in the regular requirements would have been it would have been just made economic sense to be listed only in Australia, I think, and then it's probably the stepping stone for a long term listing. But again, this is beyond that. This is all here stay. Well, that concludes this episode with Wayne Schmidt, Zero's former country manager to Australia when it first launched in 2009. As a quick recap, today we examine the listing process through Zero's own journey to becoming a publicly listed tech startup. We also look closely at the background of the two founders and the drivers that pushed them to start Zero. I hope you enjoyed what you heard today and if you'd like to hear more about how Zero differentiated itself to become a billion dollar market leader, check out our sister podcast Talking Law and look out for episode 73 or visit our show notes for this episode and we'll link right through to that episode. Well, that's it for today. If you haven't already subscribed to The Deal Room, then please head over to Apple Podcasts or your other favourite podcast player and just hit the subscribe button to get notifications straight to your phone when our next episode is out. And look, thanks again for listening in. This has been Joanna Oki and The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com 
www.radio.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 